I grew up in Siberia, and uh, my great father was sent there in exile, and he stayed there uh, for his faith, never allowed to come back. He's originally from Ukraine, uh, current Ukraine, present Ukraine. And um, one of the key passages, what uh, he taught me, which I'm going to share with you, uh, really became a foundational for my life and ministry being foundational for his life. It's a passage from uh, a book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 7. 1 Corinthians, chapter 7. And to express our gratitude to the Lord for his word, we're going to stand up and we're going to read this passage. So, could you please stand and we'll read 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, unique passage uh, in many ways. Kind of strange passage if you're a guest preacher. But I'm going to take this uh, passage and um, we'll pray that God will bless us to understand it better. Uh, chapter 7 from verse 29 to 35. Apostle Paul is saying, Paul, Paul is saying this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. For now on, let those who have wives live as those they had none. And those who mourn as those they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as they had no goods. And those who dealt with the world as though they had no dealing with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man in actions about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man in actions about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman in actions about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But a married woman in actions about worldly things, how to please your husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. This is God's word. You may be seated and we'll go deeper in our study. So Apostle Paul, in the very beginning, he's saying, I'm... He's saying, I'm saying to you what I mean, brothers. So, actually, you got to be a true, genuine believer to understand this passage. There are many useful passages for even these secular affairs. Uh, there are many, much wisdom we can borrow for our business world, our marriage life. But there's some passage that seems to be very irrational. Very strange. And this is one of these passages. you got to have a genuine faith and, believe, and truly believe in the Lord Jesus in order to understand this passage well. That's the reason why Paul is saying, I'm saying to you, my brothers. So if you're still not uh, sure that you're truly saved, this is your day to think through deeply and talk with local pastors and discuss everything what's in your heart and to make sure that you truly understand the gospel message and you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, many Bible passages are going to be really locked for you to understand. I think the key phrase of this passage could be found in verse 29. In the verse 29, he says... Time has grown very short. Time is short. What first comes into your mind when you hear such phrase? Maybe some thinking, if I will stay longer in this church service, I might be late for my football game or to watch my baseball game. Or time is short, not enough time to sleep. Tomorrow I'm going to go to do my work. Or not enough time for enjoyments. Of course, some, of, some may say, some of us may say that our life is really short. I know the Bible says about that. And the favorite psalm, 
90, Moses says, Psalm 90, 10, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. <laughs> Look, Moses seems to be like uh, flu Delta airline. Fly away. We fly away. The older we get, the much more speedier our life, right? I remember myself as a young boy and uh, spending some time with my grandparents' house. We played a lot with my brother, and um, uh, my grandma asked us to come and get breakfast. We had breakfast, we played again, and uh, after some time we had lunch, we played again, we had a nap, we wake up, we play again, we had dinner, and, we, and a day still been there, and we played again. Now, when I look at my calendar, I know what's going to happen on the 31st December. <laughs> and everything's so speedy. Everything's so speedy. We truly fly away. There was a special research done recently. Uh, the question was how our life divided in what spheres or where we spend our life if we live 78 years. So what's been found? We spend 28 and a half years to sleep if we live 78 years. We spend almost 11 years to work. Driving to work and home from work, six years. If we live in Moscow, it's probably 10 years. Study, I mean college or special training, three, half, five years. Taking meal, four years. Even fast food not really helping. Childhood, seven years. School, 10 years. Shower and restroom, three years. And I think some think that I take much more, my wife takes much more. You see, not enough time for family, children, ministry. And if you'll do simple mass, simple mass, when you just bring all these numbers together, you don't have many, many years left. You don't have much time to spend on something really worldly, worldwide, and useful. And if I count how many years I spent on standing traffic jams or lines on an illness, I would say time is very, very short. Very short. In fact, we have very little time. In addition, we do not become younger. And none of modern doctor, in principle, is able to stop our genetics. Our own cell, I mean body cell, can divide 50 plus minus 5 times, and that's it. We will die. Doctor can truly try to hide the aging process, slow it down a little, but they can't stop it. Apostle Paul uses here quite a special word that translated for us time, the appointed time. The Greek word is kairos, and you're probably familiar with this word. word. It means a very short opportunity, a favorable moment, a strategic moment that will be soon lost. The Chinese speaking about the possibility often use a saying describing the possibility of rapidly running young man with a large foreflock on his head, and you got to try to grab it, otherwise he will run away speedy. Our opportunities are very limited. We can be injured, or everything might change. I remember a young man in my old years ministry in Siberia. And you know, in Siberia, we have a very uh, strong Greek-Roman wrestling school. Uh, three times Olympic uh, champion, Alexander Karelin. He's from uh, Siberia, Novosibirsk. And uh, so it's a really big thing in there. And one young man from a Christian home, by the way, uh, 
you get a really good progress in these sport activities. And when they ask him, you know, it's a good time for you to join to our youth team and to do evangelistic events. And he said or replied, you know, I need to become a Siberian champion and I will get some time to be involved in the church ministry. So he became a Siberian champion and I came and talked to him and encouraged him again, uh, join to ministry. And he said, you know, I'm quite busy. I'm, I got to become a Russian champion. And he became. And I came again and I asked him, Alexei, it's good, great time for you to witness about your faith. And he said, Europe is calling. And he became European. And, um, and you, you can understand, it's a world. <laughs> Next step. And uh, he was doing some trainings in Italy. And because of um, young naiveness and sometimes stupidity, they were driving high-speed car, Ferrari car, and they got a car accident. And uh, two of his legs been broken. And now he's in a wheelchair. He lost his appointed time. When he shared his, or given his testimony right now, he is sometimes crying with tears because of he lost his moment, he lost his kairos to use his legs for the kingdom of God to well. Yeah, you know, there's not really much time left for us to do right and good decisions or to make. <laughs> and even more, second coming is near. Not really much time left to do. But why Paul is saying that time is very shortened? Why there is not so much time left? And the Apostle Paul given two reasons why. Look uh, at verse 31. The verse 31. In the end of this uh, verse, he's saying, for the present form of this world is passing away. The phrase, the present form, is taken from a theatrical lexicon and uh, literally means decoration, shape, outlines. And as you know, in theater, <clears throat> for each act, for each action, there is a special scenery for each production of their actors and their decoration. Paul says the theater scene is changing right now. In other words, everything in this world will be changed soon. All that we see in this world, and it seems very valuable and important, will lose its significance very soon in a connection with the common change. Today, some actors have leading roles, and tomorrow they will be completely unsuitable for a new stage. Today, something is extremely important and necessary. Tomorrow, it may be completely useless and not necessary. I will illustrate it with uh, one Japanese folk take, because if I see some children, and I want to also get their attention, my mom, when we were young boys, is my brother, she read us some Japanese folk tale, and I did remember some of them. So the story, quite an interesting story about two men living in the same village. One was very rich, and his goal was to fill his chest with golden coins, and then finally he got his last coin to put it into this chest, and finally, to feel that I'm really accomplished. And the second was uh, very poor, and he was so, so poor that uh, he looked around and just realized that nothing to eat, but there have been some, some things left, and he decided to make cooked pancakes to eat them and to die. And uh, it is quite normal for Japanese uh, folktale, something radical happened and a local river got out of its banks, and a flood came. And uh, both of these men got what's been the most important. A rich man got his chest full of coins, and the poor man got his pancakes. And they both jumped the same tree, waiting when the flood come down and uh, they would continue to live their normal life. 
But the water had been there for hours, and both of them got hungry. And a poor man ate his pancake, and a rich man can't eat his coins. So he asked this poor man to sell some to him. So he sold, he ate, but a flask spilled there. And uh, finally, he bought again, one by one. And the story comes to the end when all these coins, golden coins being delivered to this poor man, <laughs> and the water come down. And the morality of the story is very simple. You need to have not what is important today, but what you might need tomorrow. The poor became the rich, and the rich became very poor. So our time had its own special scenery, and Apostle Paul is given to us these decoration elements in verses 29 to 31. 29 to 31. Actually, even more. He used here a very interesting uh, phrase, is passing away. If I'm correctly remember English grammar, it's in present continuous tense. It means that these changes taking place already, I mean now. This is not just a matter of a distant future. Right now, God himself is preparing the whole world for a new sin. He's preparing the whole planet for a new time, a new sin of His divine purpose right now. It's not someday, sometime. It's just right now happening. And my point is very simple. This change is already happening today. God is doing Himself. That's the reason why Paul is saying to us that we must treat this value system or value system of this world in a completely different way as transitory and temporary. So what are these scenery of the life of any living person on the planet? We can see that in the verses 29 to 31. First, he speaks about family. Family, having wives, uh, those who have none. So family, it's uh, speaking about our motivation. It's the uh, highest motivation for many people in this world. Also, he uh, speaks about sorrow. It's our hopes. We feel quite depressed and we feel sorrow because of our host, hopes being lost and destroyed. Also, he talks about joys and success talking about the goals and purpose of life, also possessions of wealth, and finally about enjoyments, hobbies, our pleasures, what bring some joy to us, some pleasures to us. So five spheres, family, sorrow, joy, possessions, enjoyments. Actually, it's quite true for every human being on this planet. A life of each of us truly consists of these five spheres. And this Things are useful to us and quite legitimate. But Paul adds, saying that the image of this world with this value system is passing away right now. The things are not sinful, but they are temporal. So if they become our goals or guidelines for life, they will lead us to a wrong direction. Basically, it's gonna, we're going to come to sin against the Lord. Because the sin of this world will soon change, and we need to prepare for the next stage. It's quite important to understand, my beloved brothers and sisters, that we need to be careful not to be chained with this passing system. I need to give more... Um, maybe emphasis to prove you that it's all these things really passing away. For instance, family. They're not going to be, they're not going to be usual family in heaven. They're going to be only one family, Christ and his bride. But we all going to be much closer to our spouse, spouses than here. 
For instance, I'm married, and you see I'm wearing my wedding ring on right hand. In Russia, it's if you have it in the left hand, it means that you are divorced and opened for a new relationship. You could imagine what a shock I experienced first time I come to the U.S. I got to Shepherd's Conference, and it's been 2000, I believe, and the preaching were really good, but all pastors were divorced in my eyes. All been so boldly preaching, saying, but they haven't here. Even, even worse, uh, John, Pastor John MacArthur took us to have some lunch and just in the midst of, in a, on campus, and we all were getting meals, and some Americans were taking root beer. I had no clue what root beer means, but I knew word beer. And we're thinking, they're not divorced only, but they're also drinking alcohol in the midst of the conference. And they all were looking straight in your eyes, which really in the Siberian mentality is so disrespectful. I am full of pride. I want to conquer you with my eyes. So the second day, I didn't want to go to the conference because my conscience was unclear. <laughs> Family, it's a great blessing from the Lord, but it's not going to last forever. Only one family is going to last forever. Christ and His bride. And we're all going to be in the best wedding. And we're all going to experience the best marriage. But it's going to be marriage of Christ and His bride, His church. Sorrow, the Lord will wipe away every tear from our eye. From our eyes. Remember Revelation 7, 17, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. From our eyes. Joy. There was not and will not be any greater joy than to come to the presence of the Lord forever. Possessions. We have New Jerusalem built by God Himself. Enjoyment. What a pleasure to enjoy and what a delight to enjoy new earth and new heaven forever to praise in God or praising God there with all beloved brothers and sisters, with all saved people. So that's why the words of Apostle Paul should be not be perceived to us like strange words, but the contrary, he wants to help us to be ready for a new life, for a new scenery. He instructs us that we are engaged in our ordinary earthly affairs, but looked at them through the prince of eternity that the vector of our life will be directed to heaven and kingdom of God, eternal kingdom. So we, in our daily lives, could live the values of this kingdom and not the transitory, earthly, temporal things. If I don't understand it, if I'm not preparing myself and my family for it, we lose so much, we lose so much. So that we will not be losers and empty-handed when God, in the blink of eye, completely changed the scenery of this world, of the human history. We've got to be prepared for. Therefore, the life of real Christian truly revolves around God and His kingdom. Normal, daily routine should be built for His kingdom. You know, in my family... We're not a perfect example, but it's a kind of simple example to give to you. My family have four children. Uh, they all have birthdays. And we do our birthdays not just for only our family, but we encourage them to invite their non-Christian friends and invite even parents. And we have every birthday party evangelistic party. You do just normal things. I go to the same barber till he responds to the gospel message. If he will respond and believe, I will baptize him and he become my brother and member of our church. If he will reject, I will choose a different barber. And I will go to a different barber. Again, to build some trust and share the good news. Actually, by the way, I'm paying for his hour and I can say what I want, what is important to me. You kind of doing your normal routine, but you're thinking how I can bring the kingdom values in my work, in my family life, my relationship, 
how I can bring the kingdom values and the kingdom mindset to my reality. Because everything's going to be perfect in heaven. Except one thing, we will not be able to preach the gospel again. Anyone else. So the first reason, the change of scenery, but there is a second reason in verse 35, 32. Uh, Paul continues to give another reason why we should live differently. Look, he says, I want you to be free from anxieties. I want to be free from anxieties. If we would be seized by the things, normal good things, we would face a lot of cares and many troubles. So we'll be too anxious in our life. It, because of it's so natural to be captured by all these things, because of the fall, because of our sinful nature, because of reality, temptation, need, crying needs. We can forget about our heavenly call and uh, God's given purpose of our life. We also remember what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mountain. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 6. From verse 31 to 33. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all the things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So there are some of our responsibilities on, here on this earth that we should do. But we need to be careful not to allow them to enslave us, to set them as our main priorities. If you do that, it truly leads us to sin. It's possible to be a good businessman, good lawyer, a good scientist, and to live for the kingdom of God. The main question is, what are my values, my priorities? Because if my values are going to define my priorities, and my priorities, my life use and my character. We all care about our families. And parents usually try to do their best to, for their children. In the light of this passage, we know that the best we can do for our children is to prepare them for coming kingdom of God. This is the best thing we could do. Maybe some of us already enslaved some was already too anxious. And the Bible clearly teaches us that when we turn to Christ and live for Him, we experience fullness and true freedom. And you know why we could be enslaved by these things? Because if we might think, we usually could think that all these needed things, good things, are so important that they can satisfy our soul. They can bring true happiness and joy into our lives. And who would be against family? Who not going to compassion about your sorrow? So who will reject to enjoy or just be joyful with you? It seems to be strange. But if we look at these things as the, our priorities, not the kingdom of God, they're going to become our idols. They're going to become our problems. And we're going to trap ourselves. We're going to chain ourselves, enslave ourselves. And, if, and how we know that? Anxieties. If we're too anxious, it means that we really redirect our focus. We lost our right focus, proper focus. And uh, we need to look back to Christ to renew our heart and our view. It's good to use our routine of our lives to show and to preach Christ to others. Otherwise, we're going to be enslaved. But how we can avoid this enslavement? And Apostle Paul given us a program of deliverance in the end of verse 32 to 34. At least two main points. First, he's saying and we need to have a right motivation for our life. And right motivation is only one. Look, verse 32. Then merit cares for the Lord how to please the Lord. So the only good motivation for Christian is 
to please the Lord. To please the Lord. This is the way how we should evaluate our day. How I do please Him, not myself, not others. How I do please Him. And when we please in Him, it's a miracle happening. He fills our soul with joy, our mind with peace. We truly blessed when we please Him. God is never going to be our debtor, but He always going to be faithful to His promises. The right motivation for life of true believer is pleasing the Lord. It's our gratitude. It's our response to His love, that He first loved us. We just want to please Him because of He did and doing and going to do much more for us. The program of life. Paul given the true program. The program of life is ministry for God. But a married man in actions about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. So when, when Apostle Paul is saying about worldly things, he not say about sinful things. He's just saying that these things belong to this passing world. But when I understand it, I would do ministry for the Lord, and it's going to be my main program of life. I'm going to use my time to serve God, not just to meet my needs and desires. Apostle Paul saying simpler things, uh, similar things in the uh, book of Colossians, such a beautiful world, chapter 3, verse 17. Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks to Him through God and the Father. So the program of deliverance, pleasing God and doing ministry for God. And then finally, in verse 35, He gives us the correct response true response to this reality of passing world. The only one true response is commitment to Christ, who is standing forever, whose kingdom is eternal. Apostle Paul is saying in verse 35, I say this for your own benefit. Not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. This passing world system is trying to catch us, to enslave us, to redirect our motivation, our plans, our desires. But we need to be caught by the gospel and God's vision for our world, for our life, for our family, for our city. Paul says that he doesn't want to put some burden or yoke on them, but to help them, to help us, to live an appropriate and blessed life. Some may say that it seems to be kind of too spartanious wife, too hard wife. Uh, it's kind of, you got to do so much or... But Paul is saying that the true blessed life have two major characteristics. Constant faithful ministry to God and such a devotion without internal conflict, without divided heart. A life that honors the Lord, life that spent not in vain, life that's worthy to live, life that's worthy to tell and to share with the next generation. This is what Paul is saying to us. Because of my life always preaches what is important to me and what does not even, if I do not say anything, I still preach with my words and I still show with my life my values, my priorities, my love. And it's so blessing to preach Christ 
to show Christ and to live with Christ in this world with this passing system. So we are about to enter this new week. And Apostle Paul is encouraging us that uh, we will be careful not to lose our priorities, not to be enslaved. I would, I think I would take some courage and share a couple uh, illustrations of present time. Uh, a few months ago, there was a conference in Nizhny Novgorod, and uh, I've been there, Ecclesia Conference for Pavolgi region, and there I met a couple uh, from Mariupol, refugees. They were, they were believers, and um, so we had a good time of fellowshipping and talking with each other, and they shared their testimony. Because of this terrible war, they lost everything. And the uh, wife, our sister in Christ, he said, she said, God truly help us to be free. We've been so anxious. We're trying to build uh, our own kingdom, third house, third car, trying to find best resorts, and finally, and now we lost everything. But we never been so happy than today. It's not justification for these terrible things happening there. But if we enslaved by things of this world, it's time to give up on it. It's time to confess. It's time to redirect everything. God doesn't need to use terrible things to instruct us. God uses Bible to help us to think differently. Every day when I wake up, almost uh, I pray the same prayer. I ask Lord to help me to minister to my family and to use me for His glory wherever I go. And... Uh, that's a story I finished my preaching this morning. One day I was flying to Shepherd's Conference, and at this time, it had been a few years ago, and um, a, couple, uh, and a couple of organizations helped me with my tickets, and uh, they made unintentional mistake. Uh, they uh, purchased two tickets and forget to cancel one of them. Uh, and one was kind of a uh, wrong route. Uh, basically, I had a flight from Los Angeles to New York and to Moscow, or Los Angeles to Atlanta and to Moscow. But the flight from Los Angeles to New York had only one way, and this flight from New York to Moscow had never been there. So when I registered on my flight, um, I, I didn't know what's going to happen. So I went to, I got to New York, and there wasn't any flight to, there was a flight for me to Moscow. It had not been on my ticket. It was a mistake. I stuck in New York, having nothing in my pocket. Um, actually, my own things. But before I, uh, before I left, a friend of mine who was uh, sending me back with my bags, uh, he said, maybe you will need some cash, and he gave me uh, some money. I didn't count how much he gave to me. So I went to, uh, to Delta office asking them how I can purchase a ticket to Moscow. 
And they said the Moscow ticket cost 1600 and, and I mentioned to you that I didn't have any money which I took with me to the U.S. I took a look at my pocket which my friend gave to me, and there were 800. Not enough. I prayed in my heart, and uh, I heard somebody saying in this line, try to ask them to give you a round ticket. So I asked, can you give me a round ticket? I said, yeah, we could, 800. I gave them this 800. God's providence. I got this ticket. It was eight hours before my flight. So I looked and I said, Lord, my body, my time, not mine. It's yours. What I could do. And we started walking through this GFK airport, praying and thinking. And then finally I heard a couple barking with each other in Russian language, praise God. So I came to them, I said, you know, don't look at me like a crooked person, like a strange person, but I'm a pastor. And God, strangely, accidentally, but providentially put me here in New York. It might be for you. They look at me as a really crazy person, but they allowed me to start conversation. We talked for hours, they even fed me. Because, you know, I had no money with me that time. And uh, we finally got to a point that they trying to find happiness in each other. But it's never worked. It's impossible to be happy through any things on this planet. Only Christ can do. So we read the Bible with them. And... Uh, we had eight hours, and God, God blessed them to believe. And they now live in New York. Actually, they always live there, going to church. And was the reason why God made this mistake with my tickets. So we could spend our time of blaming others, or we can go to self-pity, or we can spend our hours for unneeded things, but God is saying to us, to us, time is short. Time is short. God is changing the scenery of this world. My brothers and sisters, let's preach Christ with our lives, with our words, with our deeds. Let's point to Him because His kingdom is forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just read this uh, special passage about our blessing and about our duty and about your provision for us, how we can live our short earthly life for your glory, for your kingdom. We all have so many different duties. Our jobs, our families, our hobbies, our passions. We face many sorrows and pains, especially these days. And we need your grace that you will keep us focused on your priorities. We ask you that you will Continue to help us to live truly devoted life for you. We need your help to raise up our kids for your kingdom, not for these passing earthly things. Lord, we need you to help us to build our life around your church and your purposes, not about our plans and our schedule. Help us to change our schedule, that we always have time for right things. We always have time for you. God, we are all grateful to you that you found time for us. You sent your son, Jesus, to die on our behalf. And you're always willing to listen to us. 
Please help us to listen to you and to obey you. And bless us to be used by your mighty hand to preach Christ wherever we go, wherever we're going to be. And bless this church and uh, bless many people through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.